I don't believe in just preaching. I don't believe in just giving a little sermon. What I believe in doing is giving a thus saith the Lord word of the Lord. When I preach, I preach prophetically. Why? Because I want to hear what God's saying right now. I don't want to just open the Bible and say, today we're going to have a topical sermon. Hallelujah. First of all, before I get into the sermon, anybody that doesn't have the River of Glory CD, would you like it? Hallelujah. Praise God. That one's yours. I was going to throw it at you, but I didn't know. I didn't want it to bounce off your head. Hallelujah. So we're just going to hand it to you. Hallelujah. There's more back there, but praise God, I have to give one away. God says every service from here on. Praise God. But the thing is, is during this time in your life, how many have ever had a vision or a dream that God has given you, and it just seemed like it's kind of gotten smaller and smaller and smaller? And then at the same time, how many have gotten, uh, gotten to a point to where you don't feel like you have a dream or a vision at all? Like you're going nowhere. Come on, this is going to hit home tonight. And how many have had something in your life that has just seemed like it's just dying? Some people right now are dying on the inside. That's even in this room. You had a vision. You had a call. You had all this in front of you. And then it seemed like the enemy came to cut, to steal, to destroy. Come on. Hallelujah. See, I could have made a choice in this past four months to, to say, well, I've lost it all uh, uh, and just get plugged into a church. Hallelujah. Come on. It would be a lot easier to let somebody else lead the things. Hallelujah. Let them catch all the junk. But God said, no, I want you to start another ministry. I want you to press in. I want you to go ahead and, and, and have all that, that I've promised you. And the reason is, is his vision, not mine. And then he said, and you're going to be a pastor in Litchfield again. I'm like, that's not, that's not my vision. I guarantee you. When you're a pastor for over five years, you don't ever want to do it again. Never. But I'm telling you, God has a vision for your life, and he is in the restoration business tonight. There's two sermons, or sermons, there's two sermons, yeah, tonight and tomorrow night, but also there's two scripture that's really the foundation of what I'm talking about tonight. Go to Psalm 62, 8. We're just going to lay a little bit of foundation tonight. And what I believe tonight, if you have a vision that is dying away, God's going to stir that thing up and give you exactly all that you need for that vision to come to pass. Some of you need to have a fire to that vision. Some of you need to have something stirred up again. Come on. Some of you need to get excited again about the things of God. There's some people in this room, you are so on fire for God, but your vision's dead. You're like, I'm just going to be plugged in, I'm going to sit, I'm going to just wait. Because I've been disappointed too many times. What I believe by the Spirit of God, as I preach this sermon, appointments are going to come instead of disappointment. Increase is going to come instead of decrease. Come on, expansion's going to come instead of falling apart. How many have gotten so excited about something for God and, and after a month or two, after a year or two, after 10 years, some of you, it's like, what's, it, what's the point of getting another word if I haven't done anything with the words I've already gotten? Hallelujah. Psalm 62, 8, here's what it says. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Go to Second Chronicles as I talk just for a moment. Second Chronicles. We got to trust at all times in the Lord. And I'm telling you, you got to trust him even when it doesn't look good. Most of the time when God gives you a vision, gives you a dream, how many know it doesn't look like it's going to happen? It's like he must have got the wrong number. It's like he had this... He called you, but it must have been the wrong number. He's looking in the yellow pages that was written in the old days. Hallelujah. You must have met the neighbor. You must have met the, met the person that was sitting next to me in the pew. How many have ever thought that? In a prophetic service, I used to think this all the time. The prophet had come over and he prophesied to me, and I'm thinking, no, oh, that's for the person behind me. He just missed it. 
It says miracles and signs and wonders are going to follow me. I'm going to preach the word. I'm like, I can't even read the word. I don't know what in the heck that means. <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand it. This one's begot that one. First of all, a lesson. If you don't understand the word of God, don't start in Matthew. A lot of times I, that's where I got started and that's where I got messed up. Because I don't want to know who's related to who. I want to know what's going on. Hallelujah. And then you start reading about prophets having different wives and all kinds of stuff. You're like, what in the world is this? This is supposed to be the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden, you realize what that's there for. And what's there for, there for. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, says this. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro, to and fro, throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Oh, mercy. Completely his. Don't you love that? Yeah, I know. Amen. <laughs> completely his. And he looks to and fro. He is constantly looking for someone. Look at the person next to you. And you need to tell them there's someone. There's, you're all someone. Hallelujah. And the hardest thing is when God gives you a vision, he gives you a dream, and you have to work that full-time job. That's the hardest thing in the world, to get that vision to come to pass. It's like, okay, I wake up at 8 o'clock, I go to work, I work 9 to 5, I get off at 5, I turn the TV on, watch my hour or two of television, I eat dinner, come on. And guess what? i got to go to bed. Why? Because i got to do it all over again tomorrow. What about the vision? What about the dream? Oh, that's during the next conference. I'll get excited again. Isn't that right? When some man comes to town and starts preaching like I'm preaching tonight, and then we get excited to get all the vision, all the dream. I'm going to preach. I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to the nations. Africa's calling me. And then a couple of days later, we seem to lose it. What I believe by the Spirit of God is as I preach this tonight, it's not just going to be a sermon that you hear, it's going to be something that's going to open your heart. Come on, get ready. Many times God says, you're going to the nations, and what does that usually mean? You're going to the nations. Does that usually mean that you're ready to go right then? Does it usually mean that you have the money? Most of the people God sends to the nations at the time they hear they're supposed to go to the nations have no money. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Try flying to anywhere in the, in the world with no money. John G. Lake gave it a try, and he, he made it barely type of thing. But understand, there's people like this. There's few and far between that have this awesome faith that we're just going to go with a few hundred bucks or nothing and just believe God's going to give us all that we need. But at the same time, if God called you, he's going to send you. If he's going to open the door, he'll open it his way. And how many know it's not, it's not our way, it's his way? Praise God. I remember the first time God says, I'm going to make you a teacher. Hallelujah. The first time that I was a teacher, I'm thinking I'm going to be a teacher in the Word of God, and I'm going to be a teacher of this giant school. Giant school. Hallelujah. This is bigger than my classroom. This room here, hallelujah. I had about 10 to 12 students. That was my, and I'm thinking big, big thing, hallelujah. I'm going to be big, hallelujah. And it was this little thing. But see, I was faithful in that, and then it expanded into another. And it expanded into another. What I'm telling you tonight, God's going to do it his way. You might as well face that. And I'm telling you, God's getting ready to do some things. There's a few things that I want us to take from these two scriptures. Number one is you and I have to completely trust God. Let me give you a bit of advice that I have definitely learned more in this past four months than I learned in all my years being a man of God. Is you're going to be put in a place to have to trust Him if you don't learn to trust Him. Everybody get excited. Come on, this means you're happy. Hallelujah. If you have to push it up, go ahead. If you don't learn to trust in God, he'll get you 
to where you will trust him. Because you're going to have to. Come on. See, I didn't have to trust in God when I had the few months of paycheck sitting, waiting to be cashed. It's when you don't have any money. That's, oh, that's a trust God type of mentality. Come on. And, and with every circumstance, in the valley times, the desert times, the good times, the dark times, no matter what season you're in, God is in the midst of everything. He's in the midst of it. And usually you can't see it. I mean, you can't see it. Anything's going on. But he's there. Now, I know there's some angels in this room, and what I mean by that is that sarcasm. That have been in this room. I'm not talking about the ones that might be around about us because we worship the Lord. I'm talking about people. There are some people in this room that you may have been to a place lately. Where's God in all this? Why hasn't he showed up in my life? Seems like he's doing nothing. How many know it doesn't look like he's doing anything, especially when he's doing something? And then all of a sudden, one day, it's like it all comes to pass, and you're like, how did this happen? How did this happen? Let me give you a, bit, uh, uh, a little, little bit of quick story because I want to get all the sermon in. It's not that long, so don't worry. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Hallelujah. Praise God, it is funny because I, I usually have three or four conclusions. But there was a time where I'm a young man of God. I, I can prophesy the word of the Lord, and I'm scared to do it. Anybody ever been there? I'm terrified. I got a, I got a prophetic anointing that came up on my life as a young man. I was about 17 years old. And every time we'd have a service, I'd never have a word for anyone, and the pastor would try to get me to minister. And I would check it out over and over and over again. But when the apostles would show up, the prophets, people that would be over hundreds of churches, that would minister all over the world, that could hear the voice of God themselves, every time they would show up to a service, guess when I got a word? It was when they were there. I'd get it for them. I'm like, uh-uh. Come on, no, I'm not going to minister to the, because if, how many know, if, a, if you minister to a, the wrong prophet, what I mean by that is you minister to a prophet and you minister wrong, he's going to let you know. I'm like, let me start with Elsie over there. Come on, let me, Gertrude over here, or, 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 or Brother Henry, he, he, he thinks I'm all, I'm just great. Let me start with him. No, God's like, Apostles, prophets show up to this service. That's the ones I'm going to have you minister to. And I'm like, so I remember the first time I went up to the pastor and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, I got a word. He goes, we got, well, why would you tell me that? We got the apostle Leon Walters here. I'm like, I got a word for him. And he goes, oh, <laughs> okay. And he stops the service. We're worshiping the Lord. He's like, hold it, everybody. Bill has a word for this apostle. Just had to make a big deal of it. I love it. I wanted to slip him a note. <laughs> God's going to do this in your family. Hallelujah. But I remember I was scared. I don't even know what I really said exactly. I don't know how I said anything. I was scared. And I prophesied to him for a couple of minutes about some things, and he began to cry. Came up to me after the service and said that blessed him, and he loved it that I ministered to him because no minister ministers to him. And he was over many ministers, but nobody would minister to him. I'm like, wow. And guess what? The next time another man of God shows up to the service, God's like, this guy's got this going on with his mom. Prophesied to him. I'm like, come on. And it happened again. 
And that's what began to open it up. How many know? I didn't know that's the way God was going to begin to do the prophetic anointing, to do the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it's like he just put me on the fast track, more or less, to prophesy the things to people who are going to really be able to critique it and judge it. I remember one time I was, and I re, I'm not trying to brag on myself. I'm just showing you how special God is to train you and get you ready for the vision he has for you. And what I mean by that is I remember one time I'm prophesying to this, this prophet and his wife, and I was prophesying especially to the man, and I, as I was ministering to him, I, I, I literally talked about what was going on with his mom. She was on, a, on her deathbed, and I said she's hooked up to a bunch of equipment. God wants you to know that she's going to be okay before you get home. He was blown away that she was on the equipment, that she was on her deathbed. She, he was blown away that that detail was there. And he goes, this gift you can't let die. He was excited. And then after a while, come to find out, praise God, she got healed. Let me just get that one out of the way. That's God. He did it. Hallelujah. It wasn't me. He did it. But during that service, after that service, what began to happen is they say, why don't you minister with me tonight? Why don't you minister with me? Why don't you go to this service over here? Why don't you go over here? I can't make it to this city. Why don't you go? Come on, that's how the doors begin to open. And why don't you go over here? Praise God. And then the God began to do other things in the area of healings and miracles begin to happen. And, and all that began to birth the very vision that God had for me. And I was a scared 17-year-old boy that God said, you're going to do this, this, and this. How many know he had a vision? And he had to open my eyes to see the vision. See, every time God speaks to your heart, the enemy speaks to your heart also. That you can't do it. That you're no good. Why would anybody want to hear what I have to say? I can't hardly talk to people, let alone preach. Come on. Yeah, look at Moses. So many of us are getting ready to be launched into all that God has for you. Not only is God in the midst of everything, but he also, we need to trust in him. He is the midst, in the midst of everything. And also, number three is he will strongly support us. When no one else will, he will. Come on. I got some more fan mail this week. Hallelujah. I, I almost brought it to read. Hallelujah. But God wouldn't let me. Hallelujah. And what I mean by that is most of the body of Christ don't understand what God is getting ready to do. If the church as a whole could take a moment to press into God with all the energy that we have to go against one another, man, how far could we go? I mean, we could, the sky would be the limit. I, 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 I typed in Billy Graham today. How many know Billy Graham's a good man? He's got history beyond history. He's done more than most men of God could ever dream of. And there's a video within the first page that talks about he's, you know, demonic or or antichrist. I'm like, give me a break. This is Billy Graham. I mean, you, we we as a body of Christ, and and the problem is, it's been posted by a Christian. Hallelujah. We got to understand God is getting ready to do some things, and a lot of the church is going to miss it. You know why? Because their focus is not on him. Oh, Jesus. Within the next month, in February, we're going to have three meetings in a row here, and then we're going to have four meetings in a row here. You know why? Because God said revival's about to break out in Springfield. So he told me to literally go harder in Springfield. Come on. Get ready. And the four nights, we're going to end up being here is the flyers are in the back is the, uh, praise God, it's the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th of February, which is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. And we're going to hit it hard. Why? Because God's getting ready to break out. Come on.
get ready. How many wants some revival in your midst? And what I mean is God stirring up the old things and stirring up excitement again, stirring up and resurrecting things and bringing in the harvest, bringing in the unsaved, people getting healed, people getting delivered, people getting set free. This room will not be adequate. How many know? Let's go on. So what are we going to do? We're going to do it according to whose plan? God's plan. Seems simple, doesn't it? Seems simple. Why do we get off of that? So many of the body of Christ gets to their plan. Come on. We get to our plan. It's supposed to be according to God's plan. God gives you a vision of all this stuff that you want to do and you're supposed to do, and then we begin to cut off the edges or add on some things. How many know God's way is the best? I remember back when we was in the revival, everybody's like, you got to get this on television. you got to get this and, and get this recorded. you got to get this streaming online right now. I said, God never said to do it. Hallelujah. How many know it was a good thing it didn't? It may have went over two years, but praise God, it's a good thing it didn't go on to television. Just imagine what weapons they'd have in them. Hallelujah. <laughs> But during this season, I want you to know God is getting ready to rebuild your vision and cause explosion of that which God's called you to do. But it's according to His plan. I realize there are different types of seasons. We need to hear this. There's seasons of extravagant giving. Sometimes you'll give and give and give because it's a season to give. Hallelujah. Give till it hurts type of thing. Come on, buy, buy because there's a season of that. I'm not taking the offering, so don't get all nervous. <laughs> there's seasons of breakthrough where there's seasons that, that you can't break through there's also seasons of breakthrough and there's seasons of blessing come on we need some of that blessing hallelujah but there's also mountaintop seasons but I you gotta hear this too there's also dry valley seasons come on it nobody been there But this is my point. We must be in sync with the season that it is. And what some people don't understand, is it has it hurt through all this? Yes, it has. And would it be best that I lay down and sit down for six months and just get, just get ministered to and all that? Yes, it would be nice if that's what, what God wants. I did sit down for a couple of months. But the reason I didn't sit down any longer because God said this is a building season. This is a time to build. And how many have been to the meetings within the past couple of months? It didn't look like it was building too, too good. How many have ever seen anything build? They spend all the time on the foundation before you even see the actual construction. It's like they're laying the concrete still. We're still smoothing it out. They're still running the underlayment. They're still getting things ready on the outside. And then all of a sudden, when the walls go up, the roof goes on. Things are accomplishing. Things are getting done. Now you can see what God's doing. But to see, uh, right now, we've got to build according to God's plan. He gives you a blueprint on how to build. Now, I also realize that Many of you have, might be receiving this revelation of this new season. That it's time to build. Build on that which God's given you. Build on what God's given you. Not on what you have. There's too many of us that have dreams and visions that are based on us. Every one of us need to go back to the drawing board. We all need to do that every once in a while. And that's what I do. Every once in a while I just go to the Lord and I say, God, if it's not you, I want it off. Come on, I don't want, we don't want the headache if it's not supposed to be God. I don't want to have a school. I don't want to have the church. I don't want to go to this city and this city and this city if it's not you. I'll minister, I'll minister at the outhouse. Come on, I'll minister at the courtyard. I'll minister in the tennis court. I'll minister in the parks. If that's what he wants, it'd be a lot easier, actually. But it's according to his plan. Some of you 
have received a prophetic word about your vision. Let's go ahead and expand that. I have a box of prophetic words <laughs> or a basket of prophetic words. I used to have a drawer. had 36 tapes in it, prophetic words. I'd pull them out, and a lot of those were full. And I'd play them. It's like, well, that ain't happening. Put the next one in. But that ain't happening either. I don't know what these guys are doing. All prophesying to me. Supposed to, so supposed to be able to preach the word. I don't even know what in the world that thing means. What are we even here for? I ain't got a full grasp on salvation. And he said, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. How many know it's according to God's plan? No matter what your dream or your vision is, your season comes with open heavens, favor, and double blessing right now. This is the season of that. Open heavens, favor, double blessing. This is the season. Get ready. Does that mean that you won't get any more of those pink bills? You know, disconnect notices. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't you hate those things? It's important to build on God's plan, not your plan. And that's why we got to constantly put ourselves down and say, God, whatever you want. Because we got to have him guiding us. A lot of times God will do something with me that is very special. You might not think it's special. But what he'll do with me is he'll teach me by teaching me to do whatever it is. Meaningless things. Just by obedience and hearing his voice. It might not accomplish anything, but one thing it does do, it sharpens the voice of the Lord. Like, turn here. All right. Sometimes people ride with me, and they kind of flip out about that. Hallelujah. It's like for praise and worship. I'll, I'll have one set, and all of a sudden, God will say, nope. So I'll just walk out of the room go, well, I've got to change it. And then I'll come back, and I'll, that ain't right either. I've got to take it back. I'm having this conversation among people. In other words, they're not, they don't know what's going on. All, he, all they keep hearing is, okay, okay. If anything, it's just obedience between me and him to keep the lines open. How many need to keep the lines open? You know what happens a lot of times? I'm going to go ahead and go this way because God wants me to. Sometimes if we don't communicate back and forth with the Lord like that, the meaningless things. It's like an artery that clogs. And every time you ignore those little guide, guiding and directing, it's like it just clogs that line just a little bit more. The next time you might not hear him as clear. And then the next time it'll be even less. And the next time it'll be even less. Come on. It's vital to discern God's voice clearly because this will give you confidence needed in order to engage yourself exactly in what he wants you to be engaged in. You don't want to be doing what you're not supposed to be doing. I remember one time this man, he went, he started a church. It was a season. Everybody started churches back then. He started a church. He had a church going with nothing but trouble for six years. A prophet came to town that didn't pull punches. How many know we need those type of prophets? He just came in, was excited about being there, preached there for three nights. On the third night, he goes, Pastor so-and-so, stand up. He said, you're not supposed to be a pastor. You started this, and it wasn't God. You wonder why there's trouble? It's because you're not in God's plan. Sometimes trouble is because you're off. God's trying to shake you up a bit. And I'm telling you, you know what that man did? He stopped and he went evangelizing. 
became an evangelist. Come on. But too many of us as a body of Christ are trying to become something that we're not. Everybody wanted to be a prophet during the 80s and 90s. Some people still want to be a prophet. Let me give you a bit of advice. Don't want to be a prophet unless it's him. And even then, don't want to be a prophet. (laughs) (laughs) It's not fun. Hallelujah. I remember when I was real young in the Lord, I, I kept telling my pastor, I said, I'm seeing things different. I was an evangelist. And I was prophesying the word of the Lord. But I said, now my heart's for the church more than it's for the lost. I thank God for the lost. And I need, we need the lost to be saved. But I said, I have a heart for the church. What? Anyway, God is really wanting us to get to a place. D- during this time in my life, all of a sudden it was like, I said, I said to him, I said, I feel like I might be getting a call of a prophet. He goes, what do you mean you're a prophet? He goes, you're evangelist or prophet? You can't be both. I'm like, well, I'm just, that's why I'm asking you. You're my pastor. A year later, a prophet comes to the house of God. He said, my son, you've been walking as evangelist. Now you're called to be a prophet. <laughs> my pastor was like, we need to receive this as our prophet of the house. It's like, where did that come from? It was his vision. It was his vision that was put in my life. I didn't want it. Come on, I didn't want it. And none of us will really probably want what God really wants for you. But your heart changes to want what he wants. Get ready. At first you won't want it, then all of a sudden you do want it. My heart used to not be for worship. Now I can't stand the silence. Why? Because I want to worship. We're all made to worship. Did you know that? We're all made to worship. During this season, some people don't understand, and I've tried and tried to tell people because I got all these emails telling me, step down, take six months off, take a year off, stop ministry and get a full-time job. Hallelujah. And these are from me. They mean well. They really do, some of them. And I kept emailing them back saying, God told me this is a building season. I have to build. They say, you're having hard times. Yes, but he provides all the time. You'd have more money if you got a secular job. I always would have more money if I had a secular job. I've never got paid that well. Come on, I've always had a very humble or no pay. Some people don't even realize the the last ministry I was a part of, I ministered for that ministry for over two and a half years with no pay. I never got a dime. I traveled all over the place, and I ministered, and I established a church, and I never received a dime until about three years ago. Come on. And then I was only making $1,500 a month. How many know in my in the printing industry I could have made a lot more than that? And I could have worked a lot less. So what I'm saying about this is people saying all these things, and here I, I email them back, say, This is a building season. I don't know how to explain it, but God told me it's time to build. I've got to establish that which He's called me to do, and I've got to bring this forward right now because of the season we're in. I could wait six months, but guess what? The season might change. And here's what God said. He said, don't be distracted by any chaos or get entangled by the enemy's schemes. Come on. He said, Bill, don't look back. Move forward. Don't look back. Nehemiah got this word as well. Keep at it because you are building at the right time and you are building on a purpose. There's a purpose. I want people to know that we as a body of Christ got to understand we've got to have freedom in the glory. It got to the place that was rigid. Hallelujah. 
There needs to be structure, but at the same time, we got to the place. And, and I thank God for all the things that, that God did, and I'm not taking away from that. But at the same time, there's some things that's going on that we constantly are, are trying to go say, we got to cover everybody up. How many know sometimes a loss is going to show up and they're not going to be completely covered? And I would rather get their soul than get their offense. Come on. I don't have to like it. I wish everybody would almost dress like a nun type of thing, and I've said that before. Everybody just come in and put your things on. Hallelujah. But how many know there's so much, there was more people getting offended over the last couple of years than they were being blessed. Revival is not supposed to be that way. Come on. Signs and wonders show up. Oh, they're ours. Get away. I thought he brought them. Come on. When I say this, I'm not saying this toward anyone because I'm saying it towards myself as well. I need to be delivered. I had to be delivered of that. The first service we had at Collinsville, signs and wonders started showing up. Big Jim started coming all over the sanctuary in the back and different places. And one woman picked it up and put it in her purse. And that old man tried to rise up again. Oh. That's a big one. <laughs> That's probably 50 carat. It's not mine. It's his. It's his signs and wonders. He brings them. Praise God. What if she goes home with it? Praise God. What if she finds out something? Well, praise God. God's going to continue, continue, continue to break us of the cycle. It's all about that, or it's all about that, it's all about that. And we got to understand, a lot of times the structure, we were in a house of God. And the reason I'm saying this is because we got to go about his vision. And God would tell me, it's time to have an altar call tonight, and we're supposed to minister. And, And as soon as I would say that, everybody would get all tense in the front. That's the leaders. Why? Because it's going to take a long time. They're like, oh, he's getting ready to have an altar call. How dare he? Revivals to have people be set free, to have people delivered. What if it took two hours? We were in our own building. We didn't have a limit. Come on. I even contacted this place, and I said, hey, you've given us a structure. We have to be out about 10 o'clock. I said, "How, how, 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 how firm are you on that? Because a lot of times we're ministering, and I look down, it's 5, 10, tell. I'm like, we got to quit. And here's what she said. We'll loosen up. We'll go ahead and put 1030 on it, and you don't have to really be that close to that either. So I'm not saying we're just going to keep going, keep going, keep going, because I want to go till God's done. Sometimes he's done at 9. Sometimes he's done at 11. <laughs> Sometimes we just won't talk about the other times. We are to put our hand to the plow and not look back. That's what God tell, told us to do. Why? Because this is the building season. This is what I'm supposed to do. And this is what you need to do. And God's going to expand your horizons right now in Jesus' name. I want to also emphasize that God's word was easily planted. Get ready for this. Easily planted. <laughs> In my heart because there was good soil. The last two years of my life changed my life. It got me to find God in a way that I never knew I could find him. I used to think he was this tyrant on on the throne waiting for me to make a mistake. I prophesied the word of the Lord. I seen people healed. I see people delivered. I see people slain in the spirit, but I never felt the power of God. I never felt the presence of God. And then one day, whenever God began to show up in my life, I felt his presence for the first time. It changed me. And then things started happening, and and all the things started coming. And and people don't realize what changed my life and brought me to that place and brought the revival and brought the signs and wonders. That's still in me. How many have heard the rumor that Bill's still on fire for God and has a newfound freedom? Anybody heard that rumor? There's not a whole lot of those rumors going around. But I'm going to start one. 
Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we got to have a new found freedom in God's glory. Part of that preparation is involved by obeying God's word. What are you doing to be faithful? Let me give you a bit of advice also. How many believe time runs out on what God called you to do? Come on. There's so many times there is a truth to that. Time does seem to run out. How many know if God says, I'm going to do something in a millennium in your life, and you haven't really done that? Well, hallelujah. Next. How many know the scripture where there's many in the word of God that fell short of fulfilling that which God's called them to do? Come on, mighty men of God. Have revelation. Hear from God. Receive prophetic words. Can hear and see God's face. Some saw his face and still fell short of that which he, he called them to do. Some of you need to get excited tonight. Because God's saying tonight, every person in this room, he's getting ready to expand. He's getting ready to increase. He's getting ready to bring an explosion of understanding of the mysteries, that which he's called you to do. Come on. I want you to know you, you can do all that you can imagine in him. Obedience will keep you from decep deception. You will not be deceived if you know his voice. How many don't know his voice sometimes? Hallelujah. Anytime. Tonight, I'm talking about dreams and visions. It's not the dreams and visions that most of us thought. But it's dreams and visions. Sometimes I dream with God. Why? Because my circumstance doesn't look pretty sometimes. Come on. How many times do I have to come back to the same road and hit the same curb? How many times do I have to hear the same word? How many times do I have to believe God again for the same amount? So sometimes I have to dream with God. Why? Because it's the only thing that can keep me going. And if I know, I know, I know, if I dream with him, it's going to be a good dream. And what I mean by that is sometimes I'll just lay back in, in, in the Lord, worship music for going for a long time, and, and all of a sudden I'll just begin to, uh, God, I see, I see I, the, the crowd's starting to come again. I see people starting to get stirred up and hungry. Come on. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a gal trying to get us to go to St. Louis to minister. Uh, uh, and uh, anyway, as I was uh, going back and forth responding to her, and uh, we, we will be going probably in March. But as I was going back and forth, praise God, with her, uh, all of a sudden she goes, oh, and by the way, the car that you prophesied months ago, I've got it now. Come on, God knows how to get all these things to come to pass. And during this time, I'm, I'm just dreaming with the Lord. Why? Because it's his vision I want in this time. Abiding in Christ... Ready to receive freedom to dream with him. This freedom we all need. I want you to look at a scripture that changed my life. Go to 1 Kings chapter 8. I read this scripture. And when I read this scripture, only two sentences, two sentences in this scripture were glowing. How many know that must be a good thing? I mean, it was glowing just like God just was like, this is what you need to look at. Come on. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. And too many of us as a body of Christ, as we begin to do that which God's called us to do, we begin to get off the course. Come on. We get so consumed about you know, when we start growing and doing stuff, and that's another thing. In the last couple of years, everybody's like, you need to get T-shirts made. You need to get T-shirts with a big old thing on them. Hallelujah. Come on, you need to get, it says glory, and, and you need to get this done. You need to, you know. 
Hallelujah. Why don't we get some people saved? Why don't we do something else? Hallelujah. Everybody gets excited about doing all this stuff. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but sometimes we as a body of Christ, once we start building and growing and stuff, then we start trying to get the sales done. I don't want to get to that point. I don't want to get to, to, to getting a bunch of product if it ain't God. Come on. If anything, he has to tell me three or four times before I get the product. Come on. He's been telling me over and over and over again to get, uh, get the uh, teaching of Python Spirit on uh, defeating the Python Spirit uh, on DVD or on, on CD and DVD. I'm like, what? Now? I don't even have a video recorder. I can record it on my phone two minutes at a time. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, let's go on. First Kings chapter 8, verse 17 and 18 says this. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. And here's the two sentences that God showed me. The first one was, now it was in your heart, in the heart of thy father, David. And the other part was, you did well that which is in your heart. It's what's in your heart. And what I'm saying was, and, and what I'm trying to say is, I want to say and do what's in your heart. In other words, it's something that God's deposited in your heart. I don't want to do it unless it's here. God's even said there's some local pastors right now that need some resurrected visions. How many know just because you have a large church doesn't mean you're doing exactly what God wants? Come on. Everybody, uh, at, at first when we was having the revival and different things, people were saying, you need to get this program. It's a program, how to build your church. Come on. Get this program. It's 50 bucks. How to build your church. We can all watch it and build it. Praise God. A month later, we still had 15 people. She goes, she came up to me again. I can order it. I'll pay for it. How to build your church. I go, we're doing exactly what God wants to do. I said, something's, this is what God wants, and that's what we're going to do. I don't care if we have 15 people forever. And then all of a sudden, it's like we started getting hit with the presence of God. We're like, let's go ahead and have a service tomorrow. Come on. And then we all started getting hit, and we all started getting slain in the spirit, laughing and falling over. Wasn't normal. Why would you come back tomorrow? Why not? And then on Sunday, we'd have the service, all get hit with the, with the presence of God, and then we're like, let's come back. After we eat, let's, let's go back and have another service. Come on, that doesn't make sense. And we'd have another service. And then we'd grow to 17 people. <laughs> Come on. But throughout the months, we begin to grow and grow and grow. Why? Because God was showing up. It wasn't how to build your church. It was getting close to God. Just like in the midst of this, when we was having some services where it was just a handful, which I still call this a handful, and God would say, don't go after people, just go after my glory. When my glory comes, people will come again. Why? Because you know them by their fruit. Nobody's going to be able to take away what God's going to begin, begin, uh, begin to do in our midst and what he has already done. People are getting healed. People are getting set free. Words are coming to pass. Come on. That's fruit. Get ready. I believe David's desire in that scripture to build a house of the Lord was birthed by abiding in his presence. When you abide in God's presence, that's when he bursts the vision, the dream. How many have been called to do something and you just haven't done it yet? Everybody should raise your hand. We haven't done something. Come on. Come on. We all need to be honest. 
I'm like, yeah, we, I know kidding. I, your hand was up even though I couldn't see it. <laughs> what God birthed in my heart during this season is there's a whole lot more. I thank God, I don't want to just get back to revival. I want to get back to explosion of people coming in, getting fed, getting set free, getting delivered. Come on. I want to get to the place. Just recently, God told me to call uh, one of the international ministers that came through the revival that was blessed. I got to minister to him. He told me to call him. God told me to call him. Let me say this. I don't do anything unless God tells me to do it. And I got an, uh, uh, kind of an email from another guy, and he says, by the way, do you know this guy? Guess, who, guess whose name he asked if I knew. It's the guy God told me to call. It's like, yeah, I know him all right. I said, I think we're supposed to do something. I don't know what. How many know God is getting ready to do something in your life, and you've got to be obedient to do it when he says to do it. A lot of people wander around wondering what their call is. I loved it in the time of the prophetic, uh, when God was moving big and prophetic, especially in the 80s and some of the 90s. Everybody's like, what, what am I called to be? Come on, what am I called to be? And there was tests. How many ever took one of those tests? You, you fill out this paper, and it's going to tell you what you're called to be. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I filled that thing out four or five times. It was different every time. Hallelujah. Come on. This week I feel like eggs. Next week I feel like hamburger. Come on. This week I feel evangelistic. This week I feel like I want to see people healed. And I'm telling you, a lot of it, we're still wondering around, what am I called to do? Listen. Discerning the call boils down what burns in your heart. What does your heart say? Mm, got quiet. I've seen time and time again, God always places what he has called you to do in your heart first. Over and over and over again. You might not like it, but it's there. I know I'm supposed to do that. It comes by dreaming with God and supporting the word from heaven. Often a prophetic word. Sometimes we're supporting the word that God gives you. God gives me, gave me a lot of prophetic words. But how many know I had to get the vision? You don't just get a prophetic word. You've got to get the vision. I received a prophetic word, and I've said this a hundred times, but a lot of you weren't there, so I'm going to say it again. I received a prophetic word that said, My son... You're going to lay hands on the sick. They're going to recover. Miracle signs and wonders will follow you. You'll preach the word of God. And during that word, there's a part in there that I never heard, but one day I finally heard it. Study thyself to show thyself approved. Study the word to show thyself approved. A workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Continue to study my word, and then, You'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Miracle signs. And, and I'm like, my goodness, I didn't hear that first part. How many know God gave that first part the first time? But I didn't hear it. What are you doing with the vision God's given you? Are you waiting on the couch, waiting for it to come? Come on. There's another American Idol season coming. The crabby guy's gone. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I don't like it, so I'm not, going, I'm, not, I'm not doing a commercial for it. I gave up the one year that the person I wanted to win lost. Okay. And I don't understand the word American. Idol? We're not supposed to have idols? But anyway, let's go on. Mm -hmm. I knew that would get you excited. Hallelujah. People love it when I pick on television. Somebody's supposed to get rid of their television. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, I want us to get to the end of this before I get it. time to minister. How many know the scripture in Ephesians 3.20? It says, Now unto him. 
that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. He is able to do amazing things beyond what you can imagine. I can imagine. I can think of some pretty big things. Not just enough gas to get to the meeting tonight. I can think bigger than that. Come on. Hallelujah. I can think bigger than him supplying all my needs. Bigger than getting the rent paid. Hallelujah. That's still a nasty word. I've never paid rent in my life. I'm paying rent. That's just disgusting. Hallelujah. I'm still getting delivered. Everybody receive it. You don't hear that many ministers say they're still getting delivered. What does above what you can think mean to you? It's according to the power that works in you. There is power often, untapped power, working, affected on the inside of you, and it works in you. How many want to untap the power that works in you? He can only do above what you can think and dream based on the power that works in you. (laughs) It's already in there. One time my pastor gave a sermon talking about ragu. That was the name of a sermon. All the religion in the house got all tense as soon as he said it. I'm going to talk about ragu today. Come on. It was a good sermon. I liked it. I like it. I like sermons that aren't structured. Yeah, that's right. He preached about ragu. He goes, what's their motto? It's in there. Whatever it is, it's in there. <laughs> Come on. And he began to just turn that thing and flip it and flop it so many ways. And he talked about how the Holy Spirit, he, he's in there. It's all in there. The power is in us. It's already in us. Greater is he that's in us. He just continues. It's in there. We're all like ragu. Come on. Now understand that's a good word. We need to receive those type of things. It's in there. It's according to the power that works on the inside of you. You tap into that power, that creative power, when you dream and allow yourself with the Holy Ghost to dream. And it cultivates that desire. God wants to mold and make you into that which he's called you to be. That's dreaming with him. How many know that sometimes as they're molding a vase, it doesn't look like a vase at first. It looks like a big old plop. Come on. But they keep molding, <laughs> spinning that thing. And then it starts oozing out. It's like, what in the world is going to happen here? But they know what's going on. It's going to look pretty when it's done. Don't even let me get start talking about the fire that have to do with it. I did a sermon on that one time. Remember, dream God's dream. It's dreaming with God. Disappointment causes us to dream short of what God's called you to do. How many have been disappointed so many times you pretty much have set your dreams to that? All right, God, I can't really go beyond this because I've been disappointed this many times. Don't get excited too much. It calls forth those things that are not as though they were. And when you really dream with God, it's like you see it and feel it. You can see it and you can feel it. Sometimes I, I just begin to press into God and I begin to uh, dream with Him and all of a sudden I can see it and I come out and I'm excited and everybody else is like, we still got the stack of bills. We still got this. There's, there's nothing. Hallelujah. But I've just got done dreaming with God and I see all the somethings. I can see it. I can almost feel it. But it's not here, but I can see it. We're going to talk more detail about that tomorrow night. This is a season which is being established. It's a season of which things come forth. How many want to see the season of coming forth? Come on. How many want to come into the season of the reality? Not the season of believing, but the season of receiving. 
That's what we're coming into. The season of receiving is about to begin. I mean, it's about right here. It's in the place of waiting in his presence. It's expectation, hope, desire, dreams that are birthed. When you are sitting and soaking in God's presence and you are thinking upon him and thinking upon what he's called you to do, it's like you're in an incubator. Come on. What happens in an incubator? They start, <laughs> hallelujah, that's not exactly what I was looking for, but praise God, it, it does get hot, hallelujah, and I'm sure that's part of it. But things start to come forth. Come on. How, how many want to get into that incubator and get it over with? Some of us, we're in there so much, we get it the hot and then we get out. Uh-huh, I'm going to head and use the hot since she opened it up. Gets hot and then we get out. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's something really powerful in that because God is saying build, and many of us right now in the natural don't have anything to build on. Come on, God says to me, build, after I just walked away and have nothing. He's like, build, <laughs> build. What am I supposed to build on? My box of clothes? Come on, what am I supposed to build on? And then all of a sudden, God begins to show me. It's building on his dreams, his visions. Get ready. We might not have people, resources, or finances, but we're supposed to build. We have God's dream, and he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what I can ask or think. He just, uh, he just wants us to quiet our soul and wait for him sometimes. That's hard. When you have nothing. Hallelujah. You know, it would have been a lot easier to work at McDonald's. Come on. It would have been a lot easier to flip a burger and to get paid. Well, I could, but. And I'll have to admit, in this four months, I've considered going back to secular work. I've considered walking away from ministry. I have. Why? Because it would be easier. Why would God cause me to build up a revival and to the extent that I did and be able to walk in all that I've walked in and then to walk away and all of a sudden it's like it just the storm just came. And I was left. Why do I have to rebuild again? And that's what God's been saying. Every prophetic word I've received since I've left is you're coming into the bigger and better than what you've done. One of the first prophetic words I received from a, from a prophet that came to my door after I left, and here's what he said. He said, where you were was cutting the very life of God out of you, and it is my will that you left to save your life. Come on. Come on, that's a good word. See, people don't understand sometimes it's God in the midst of the unknown. What? Why would God do it this way? I don't know. It doesn't line up to a lot of things that I thought was structure. But how many know sometimes he knows what he's doing? One thing I do want to put out there. Everybody needs to hear this. Until anyone has walked a mile in my shoes, nobody can judge. Until anybody's walked a mile in your shoes, nobody can judge you. This is a season of building. This is a season of coming forth. This is a season of fulfilling that which God has called me to do. And where I was, I was at the ceiling. There was no more growth. Nothing else would ever happen. Why? Because it wasn't allowed. You know what I was told by a few people in my, in, in my leadership? That it was right to ban people from church. It's right to cause people not to be able to come. 
it's right to get this list. And I'm telling you, we got to understand all that stuff I was in agreement with. Why? Because I was blind. But the day I left, the very day I left, my eyes were totally open. I was like, oh, my goodness. What about this one, this one? My, the, their blood is on my hands. Come on. And I had to go through a season of repentance. God, forgive me. Come on. And I hope to God I get to minister to those people who I, who I was in agreement of get, keeping out of church. Church is for everyone. Come on. What if they got a demon on them? Well, let's get it out. Isn't that part of what we're supposed to do? Cast out devils? I knew you'd be excited. The reason I keep going back to some of this is because somebody here is wanting to report back. And that's why I went down this road tonight, because I'm going to give you a report. You come back again to do what you're doing tonight. I'm going to come at you with both barrels and expose you. I'm not saying I'm looking at the person that's doing it. You know who you are. But also, I'm going to tell you that God loves you and he's healing you right now in Jesus' name. He's going to cause some of your children, physical children, to come into the house of God and be saved within a matter of months. You think you're doing right, but you're not. You're believing a lie, and God's going to expose that lie. Come on. Your discerner's off. God's going to turn it back on, and you're going to see the wolves in sheep's clothing. Just as the way God showed me, he's going to show you. Aren't you happy? Hallelujah. You say, who is it? If it's not you, you don't have anything to worry about. Praise God. Now, I, let me say this, and this is what I've been doing lately. I welcome spies. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. You might get some. Hallelujah. Get, come, get healed. Get set free. Get delivered. Get excited. Come on. I want, the, I want the type of spies to show up and have to report back. Man, that was good. <laughs> come on. Hallelujah. Get them. Hallelujah. I've been in a lot of ministers' uh, services over the years, and over and over and over again, they would have spies come into the service, and they're all wanting to get them. I'm like, yeah, let's get them, but not like you want to get them. Let's just pour out the love of God on them and blow them away. Hallelujah. Even if some pastor tells you, you could go and find out what's going on and, and, and find out what they're doing and, and, and report back to me so that we can know how to pray. As long as it's blessed and not cursing, pray away. Hallelujah. Sorry, I, sometimes I get a little tense when I start dealing with stuff like that. Somebody's got a collarbone being healed right now in Jesus' name. Your collarbone is going to shift and come into alignment, be healed and made whole. Something happened in the area of surgery in the past, and God's going to fix it now in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody's being healed. has to do with your back, but your collarbone's the problem. You're going to be healed right now in Jesus' name. Also, somebody's got something in the, I hear the pallet, something in their pallet being healed right now in Jesus' name. Just receive it right now. Somebody's got a uh, clogged uh, hearing a little bit in their left ear. God's going to open up the left ear right now in Jesus' name. That's one thing I love about what's going on right now is we still get a lot of testimonies, a lot of testimonies. Come on, hallelujah, God's good. I'm going to.